reading today is from verse 1 to verse 20. And I'll be reading from the NIV. It might be slightly different from what's on screen, but let's read together. What advantage then is there in being a Jew? What value is there in circumcision? Much in every way. First of all, they have been entrusted with the very words of God. What if some did not have faith? Will their lack of faith nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true and every man a liar, as it is written, so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. But if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing his wrath on us? I'm using a human argument. Certainly not. If that was so, how could God judge the world? Someone might argue, if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? Why not say, as we are being slanderously reported as saying, and as some claim that we say, let us do evil that good may result, their condemnation is deserved. What shall we conclude then? Are we any better? Not at all. We have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. Just so far in God's word. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Conrad. I'm part of the team here. Uh, I am new here. Uh, and so I'm still trying to figure out why we allow Andrew up here. <laughs> Can't believe he did that to the kids. And us. I'm just kidding. Should have seen what he did to me at youth the other day. Have you heard? Go ask him. Go ask him what he did to me. Uh, before we get going, let me just highlight one thing coming up, uh, which is important for you guys to know about. Uh, we do something here at Emmanuel called Discovering Jesus. Uh, it's a five-week course. It starts on Tuesday, the 20th of Feb uh, at 7.30. It's going to be here. And this is really aimed uh, at any of you who would like to find out a little bit more uh, about what Jesus is about, what he was like what he stood for, and what it meant that he uh, was God in the flesh, who became a man. It's really for someone who'd like to discover Jesus. Uh, if that's you, can I encourage you to sign up for this? Uh, you're going to need to RSVP, um, but you, uh, the, the, the email address for you to RSVP at is, is behind me, info at emmanuelchurch.co.za. Uh, even if... Uh, you've been following Jesus for some time, and you just like a bit of a firmer grounding in exactly what it is that we as Christians believe, uh, can I encourage you? Come along. Uh, it will definitely be worth your while. It'll run for five weeks, uh, starting on Tuesday, the 20th of Feb, 7.30, uh, right here. Let me pray for us, and then we can get stuck in uh, to this chapter of Romans. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, as we come to your word once again, we pray and we ask that you would help us still our hearts, um, still our hearts that we would hear you and that we would see Jesus' glory once again. In his name we pray. Amen. Uh, I said to the 815 service that this, this morning marked a, marked a first for me. I set my alarm uh, for three o'clock this morning for the express purpose of ironing the shirt that I'm currently wearing. <laughs> Last night when I went to bed, um, the power was about to go off and I realized I don't have a shirt. 
to wear uh, a, an iron shirt to preach in. Uh, and then when I looked at the load shedding schedule, I realized that when I wake up in the morning, I'm not actually going to be able to iron it then either. So I set an alarm for somewhere between 12 and 4 this morning to wake up and to iron this very shirt. Um, so please show me grace <laughs> if, if I've missed a spot. Um, it's, it's a 3 a.m. job. Uh, but one thing which is remarkable about being awake at 3 o'clock in the morning is just how still it is. It is so quiet. It's dead quiet. And it's not really something that we're used to anymore. Um, living in the city, living in the suburbs, there's so much buzz. There's such a hustle and bustle with cars and dogs and cats and babies and bicycles and the radio and the TV and podcasts or, or whatever it is. Sometimes even our own thoughts It's hard just to find a a moment that's still. Uh, It's almost awkward when we do find a moment that's still. But when we do find a moment that's still, uh, it's almost loud. We notice it so starkly and so clearly. Um, This silence, that stillness, uh, is really what Paul wants you and I to walk away from this chapter of Romans with. Um, And if you don't believe me, have a look at verse 19 with me right at the end of our section today. He says this, And now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced. The whole world, Paul says, should come to a point here in Romans where we are still, where we are silenced, not a tranquil kind of silence, but a silence because we really have nothing left to say. We really have nothing left to say. We've been working our way through Romans over the last while, and Paul has been writing to the Roman Christians, and for the past two chapters, he's been trying to make the case that everyone is guilty before God. Everyone stands condemned before God. Uh, The Jews, the Gentiles, whether, whether you're religious or moral or neither of those things, Paul says everyone um, stands guilty, stands condemned before God, and he's been trying to build this case. His focus in the previous chapter has been on the Jewish folk. Um, these, <clears throat> excuse me, these were the conservative religious people of his day. Uh, and what he's really been doing is he's been calling into question their tendency to depend on other things to exempt them from God's judgment. And they really tend to depend on two things. The first thing which they regularly depend on is their morality, their good works, that somehow they are able to do just enough good things or enough good things and moral things that God would excuse their sin, that he would overlook it, that he wouldn't judge it. Um, And Paul has dismantled that for them. He said to them that... Their morality, the standards to which they hold the Gentiles, the standards, moral standards to which they hold the rest of the world, they themselves are not even able to uphold those. And the second thing which they tend to depend on to escape God's judgment is their religiosity. That somehow by them doing a certain amount of religious things, by observing certain practices and keeping certain days separate, that God would overlook them in his judgment, that somehow they would muster up some favor with him so that when he judges, he overlooks them. And Paul has dismantled this dependence for them as well. He said to them that they are really hypocrites because they do all these religious things on the outside, which makes them look good. But on the inside, they're not able to even live up to these own standards of theirs. As we get here to chapter 3, Paul steps into concluding his argument, um, and he does this in three ways. He corrects two misconceptions that people have about God, one about his judgment and one about his attitude towards sin. And then finally, uh, he wraps up his argument by showing some last evidence that the whole world is guilty. There's really no one who would be able to escape God's judgment. And so we're going to follow along uh, with Paul this morning uh, in that order. 
Um, we're going to look at, number one, a misconception about God's judgment. Number two, a misconception about God's attitude towards sin. And then number three, why the whole world is indeed guilty. If you've got your Bibles with you, keep them open. They will be helpful. Uh, I want you to see, firstly, a misconception about God's judgment. From this point in Romans, it's really natural to ask the question whether there is, in fact, any value and advantage in being a Jew, in doing all these religious things which God has instructed and commanded them to do. If they are truly equally under the same judgment as those who don't do these things, then what's the point of doing them in the first place? And this is the question that he opens chapter 3 with. Have a look at verse 1 with me. What advantage then, he says, is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? And here's his answer, verse 2. Much in every way. First of all, or chiefly, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God, he says. That's the value. That's the value in being part of God's people. That God chose to make himself known, to reveal himself to one group of people, and that's Israel. He gave them his promises about the coming Messiah. He explained to them how his world works, how they can live in his world, what arrangements can be made for them to be in a relationship with him through the sacrificial system. All of these things were entrusted to them and to them alone. They had early access. They had the first preview of God and his promises. They have the promises, the joy, the hope. They had it, this one people, before anyone else. Before anyone else. Now, if you have an investment mind, uh, your warning bells are going off at the moment. Your warning bells are going off. Uh, because that means that God entrusted all of his promises to one people. Isn't that one of the golden rules? Don't put all of your eggs in one basket. He's put all of his money on one stock. What happens if the stock crashes? What happens if the basket falls? What happens if Israel botch it? Verse 3. What if some were unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Now here's the challenge. God enters into this agreement with this one people, Israel, and they are unfaithful. They don't keep their side of the deal. They don't keep their side of the deal. What will God do? Well, he really just has a few options here. One option is that he breaks his side of the covenant, right? They didn't keep their promise, so now I won't keep my promise. The problem with this is that that would make God unfaithful. That would make God unfaithful because he said he promised one thing and now he goes against his promise. Another option is that he completely ignores the fact that they've broken their side of the promise. He completely ignores that they've turned their back on him, acts like it never happened, he sweeps it under the rug. The problem with this is that it also proves God unfaithful because part of God's promise to them is that he will punish their sin if they sin. Part of his promise is that he will punish their sin if they sin. If he doesn't do that, he's also gone back on his promise. Do you see where the question comes from? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Will their unfaithfulness push God into a corner, into a position where he doesn't actually have any choice? but to become unfaithful. In Paul's answer, verse 4, of course not, he says, not at all. Let God be true and every human being a liar, as it is written, so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. You see, there's another option. There's another option for God in the face of them breaking their covenant and the third option is this, that he judges them. That he judges them. Rather than turning his back on their promise or ignoring their sin, that he takes their sin seriously and he sticks to his word and he judges them as he said he would. 
here's the point. The fact that God punishes sin, even the sin of his own people, is part of what makes him so good. It's a part of his goodness that he takes sin seriously enough to judge it. Imagine a judge who sentences guilty people from every other neighborhood in the city except people from his neighborhood who are guilty because they are his people. Would that be a good judge? No, it wouldn't be a good judge. It it doesn't make him good. It makes him unreliable and it makes him unfaithful to his promises to uphold justice. The fact that the people of God, that the, the Jewish folk are equally under his judgment as the Gentiles is what makes God so faithful. It is what makes him so reliable. It is what makes him so good. And this is the misconception that Paul is trying to correct here by this back and forth questioning with himself. The misconception is this, that somehow God would be perceived as unfaithful or unfair or wrong for judging certain people. In this case, the Jewish folk. That somehow he'd be abandoning his faithfulness if he showed any sense of judgment to them. But Paul says the opposite is true. He'd be unfaithful if he didn't. He'd be unfaithful if he didn't take sin seriously enough to judge it. He'd be favoring them. Now God's justice or God's judgment is an uncomfortable thing for us to speak about. For many of us, it's something which is incredibly distasteful. But at the same time, we would agree That if God didn't take sin and evil seriously enough to deal with it, that he would be immoral, that he would be unfair. Aren't we sometimes a little inconsistent when we cry out for justice against the government or a municipality or some sort of social issue or a colleague or a family member, but as soon as God wants to take action and take justice, it's unmentionable. We make him out to be the bad guy. We call all these people bad for not doing the right thing when they should. But then we call God bad for doing the right thing when he should. Often we're a little bit inconsistent here. As hard as a pull as that is for us to swallow when we may be at the receiving end of his justice, we must admit that this fact that God judges impartially is a part of what makes him so good and so faithful. So that's the first misconception that Paul tackles head on here. God is good because he judges. He isn't unfair because he judges. The second misconception that I want you to see is a misconception about God's attitude towards sin. Have a look at verse 5 with me. But if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust in bringing his wrath on us? I'm using a a human argument. Verse 7, someone might argue that if my falsehood enhances God's truthfulness and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? Why not say, as some slanderously claim that we say, let us do evil that good may result. Do you see what he's saying? If our unfaithfulness proves that God is faithful in judging our unfaithfulness, surely the more unfaithful we are, the more faithful God appears, right? My brother and I used to race one another when we were kids uh, to see who could carry the most grocery bags from the car to the house. Have you ever done that? Maybe I'm the only one, that's okay. Uh, we, we, we used to, you'd win basically if you had more bags with you, if you'd be able to carry more bags. The heavier weight you could carry, the better you looked. Um, here's Paul's logic, right? The more grocery bags God can carry, the better he looks. And so let's give him more grocery bags to carry. Let's go buy extra groceries and pack them in extra bags and just give them to God. Let's, con- let's go on sinning because it makes God look so good when he judges it. Why don't we just have a field day 
If this is so, what would we say then? That God is unjust in bringing his wrath on the Jews? Verse 5. That somehow God would be unjust for being angry about all the grocery bags they were giving him. Verse 5. That somehow he should be grateful for their sin and how good it makes him look. And as a result, excuse them from condemnation. Verse 7. Is this how we should think? Paul's answer, verse 6. Certainly not. Certainly not. If that were so, if our sin really made God look greater, therefore we could sin as much as we want, how could God judge anyone? How could God judge anyone? If God excuses the Jews from condemnation because their sin makes him look so good, then surely he should excuse the Gentiles from condemnation because their sin makes him look equally good. And you end up with God who's not judging anything. Verse 6, how could God judge the world? And this is the second misconception that Paul is trying to correct here. And the misconception is this. The misconception is that sin is somehow trivial to God. That sin is somehow so trivial and wishy-washy that God would reward some people for the very things that he judges others for. It's a crazy way to think about God. Imagine a God like that. Imagine a God like that. Yet how often don't we think about our sin and God in this way? We might not argue this exact argument, but how often have we not trivialized some of our sin, enjoying the smaller sins because they're not so much, they're not so serious as, as the bigger ones, you know? I mean, how harmful can some of these things really be? What about the things which don't actually seem to harm anyone? You know? It doesn't really harm anyone. It doesn't hurt anyone. So is it really then that serious? Or what about some of those things which we just entertain on the side? We just do it every now and then. Do you see how we trivialize sin too? Paul says, this is not what God is like. God takes sin seriously. God takes all sin seriously. And I want you to see thirdly and lastly that this is really why the whole world is guilty. Because God takes all sin seriously. Have a look with me at verse 9. What shall we conclude then, Paul says? Do we have any advantage? Referring to the Jewish folk. Not at all, he says, for we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. You see, the Jewish folk, Paul says, they may have the advantage of having received God's promises first, of having received God's word, of of knowing him, of understanding him and how he works in the world. But despite that, verse 9, they stand just as condemned as the Gentiles. They don't really have any advantage, he says. Why? Because they too are under the power of sin. The very things they condemn the Gentiles for doing, they do. The very way in which the Gentiles trivialize sin, indulge in it, and recommend it to others, the Jews do as well. Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. Verse 9. As it is written, verse 10, he says, In his concluding evidence statement, There is no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. What point is Paul making? The point that Paul is making is that no one standing before God is justified. The words no one 
or not even one or all, you would have noticed, come up like seven times in the space of just a couple of verses. Paul is making the case that everyone, the whole world, stands condemned before God. Now, Paul's not saying here that every one of us is as bad as what we can be. Paul's not saying that we are as as wretched and as bad and as sinful as we can possibly be. What he is saying is that no one can escape being bad in some way. No one can escape being bad in some way. No one is completely good. Each of us falls short at some point. I heard an illustration this week, which I found really, really helpful to explain exactly what Paul is saying here. Um, you've heard of the Freedom Race before? How many have heard of that? The race between Robben Island, uh, it's, a, it's a swim, between Robben Island and Bloberg, the coast. It's, it's an open swim, an open water swim, that's 7.4 kilometers long. I think you've got to be crazy to do that. Sorry if any of you have done that. I think you're crazy. Uh, but, but imagine on race day, imagine on race day that two people, two swimmers drown. One swimmer in the hustle and bustle of that opening kilometer drowns before even reaching the 1K mark. And the second swimmer, just after the seventh kilometer, just before the end, out of pure exhaustion, can't take it anymore and drowns there. Out of those two swimmers, who would you say is more drowned? <laughs> There's no such thing, right? They're, they're equally drowned. Whether it happened just before the first kilometer or whether it happened just after the seventh, what Paul is saying is that not everyone falls 7.4 kilometers short from God's standard. What Paul is saying is that whether you fall 7.4 kilometers short or only 400 meters short, you're short. You're short. Whether you're drowned at one or seven, you've drowned. And this is really why none of the things that anyone depends on to make them right before God is able to uphold besides Jesus. This is why religiosity alone is not dependable. It may feel like the religious person has ticked some of these boxes. They appear as someone seeking after God and trying to understand God. They make certain sacrifices. They keep certain days holy. They abide to certain standards and rules. They may even try really hard to understand God and to seek Him, verse 11, but Paul has said they do the very things that they condemn others for. The very moral standards that they hold others against are the ones they themselves aren't able to hold against. The verse 13 to 18, they don't do, even if they may do verse 11. And this is the very same reason that morality alone is not dependable either. And we may stay away from the incredibly immoral things. We, we may try really hard to stay away from 13 to 18 and not do the really, really bad things. But as someone really helpfully in our growth group pointed out this past week, even if you're able to stay away from all the wrong things, can you say that you've actively pursued all the right things? Because surely what it means to be good is not just not doing bad things, but also actively doing good things. And even if you've been able to perfectly do both of those things, can you say that you have wholeheartedly pursued God, verse 11, that you've turned towards Him, verse 12, that you seek Him and you understand Him with everything that you've got? And you give Him the worship that he deserves as creator. You see, what Paul does by bringing this last list to the end of his argument is he shows that there is really no Jew or Gentile who doesn't fit in there somewhere. 
And I suspect that neither you nor I can evade this list either. None of them had a leg to stand on. Not depending on their innocence, not depending on their morality, not depending on their religiosity. None of those things were enough to stand uncondemned before God. Everyone, in some way, is here. Now we know, verse 19, that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced, and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. What Paul is saying is that when we look at the Bible and we look at ourselves, we don't walk away with a list of justifications as to why God should accept us. We walk away with a list of accusations as to why he shouldn't. When we look at God's law, when we look at his standard, we become conscious of our sin. As we wrap things up this morning, we open a passage like this, or we come to this point in Romans, and we either feel the weight of our condition, or we don't. We either feel the unreliability of our good works and our religious works, or we don't. We either sense the seriousness of our sin and God's judgment, or we don't. To put it another way, we either have a hard heart, a heart of stone, or a softened heart that feels the weight and the guilt. Both of these hearts are heavy. One is heavy because it's a stone. And the other is heavy because it carries a lot of guilt. But the strange thing is that relief for both of these hearts is found in the same place. I'm proud to say as a young man that I've learned to appreciate old hymns. And the Christians of old used to say that there's no better place for a stony heart to go than the cross, where God's anger, where we see God's anger poured out on his son, Jesus. Henry Light, a poet from the 19th century, wrote this. It'll come up behind me. Lord, I would stand with thoughtful eye beneath your fatal tree and see you bleed and see you die And think what love to me. Dwell on this sight, my stony heart, till every pulse within shall into contrite sorrow start and hate the thought of sin. Why is the cross the best place for a hard heart to go? Because at the cross, we see sin being judged and sin being judged in our place. There is no greater evidence that God takes sin serious enough to deal with it than when his son is crushed. But at the same time, this is the same place for the softened heart to go, the heart which is laden with guilt and heavy with sin, because this is the place Not only where God's judgment is poured out, but where God's judgment is poured out on our behalf. Henry continued in that hymn. Did you for me, my Savior, brave, the scorn and scourge and gall, the nails, the thorns, the spear, the grave, while I deserve them all, help me some return to make to yield my heart to thee and do and suffer for thy sake as thou hast done for me. Do you have some return to make 
whether your heart is heavy with stone or heavy with sin, there is only one place to return to you. Why not today? Let me pray. Lord, we cannot help but come to the, to the end of these first two and a half chapters and feel our guilt and our sin. We cannot help but feel silenced after every possible justification has been brought forth. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that this condemnation is not something that we need to carry. We thank you that for those who are in Christ, that has been poured out on Christ, that we can go to the cross and we can see our sin judged instead of us judged. Oh Lord, we pray that you would soften our hearts too. Where we have come, become complacent with our sin, where we have tried to justify our sin, when we have treated sin as trivial, when we have treat, seen you as unfair for judging sin. Lord, would you change us? Would you let us feel this burden so that we can see the glory of Jesus? In his name we pray. Amen. Well, it's only by the blood of